Okay, I think we've given everyone a few extra minutes to get connected. Um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Uh, you can either use the agree button or um, use the chat window just to indicate that the audio is coming through okay. So this morning's session is about NTOP and uh, what it is and what we use it for. And uh, we're going to go over uh, a fair amount of detail about NTOP. Uh, I've, in getting ready for this session, I was trying to think back uh, when was the first time I installed NTOP and why did I do that? And it's uh, it's been quite a while, so I can't say for certain when I first started using NTOP, but uh, some of the screenshots I have from, from years past indicate it might have been about 2002, uh, possibly 2001. So NTOP's been around a long time, uh, and obviously I've been around a long time. And in those days, I, again, was, I was trying to think back why I was using NTOP back then. Um, of, of course, bandwidth is always an issue, so most likely I was trying to see what users on the network were uh, utilizing or hogging the most bandwidth that was available. But I also recall uh, using NTOP at various times in which there was a virus or malware outbreak. And NTOP was a really good way to, uh, because we didn't have uh, too many other tools uh, to identify hosts that were infected. And NTOP, based on their network traffic or their network signature, um, NTOP was a good tool to uh, help us identify which hosts had been infected. So, you know, just from those kind of uh, two examples, you can see it's a very versatile tool. Um, it, uh, it does take uh, a learning curve. It does require that you get to know the product, um, but uh, I can't imagine living without it at this point. So um, what are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to, like I said, we're going to explain what NTOP is. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what I'm going to call usage scenarios. Uh, how do you set up NTOP? Where do you put it? What do you do with it? And uh, what, um, what are we commonly using it for these days? I'm going to talk briefly about uh, NTOP and also its comparison to NTOP NG, which is just an a new product that's uh, literally NTOP next generation. It works differently than NTOP. Uh, there's uh, more involved with NTOP NG, um, and what it delivers to the administrator is a little bit different as well. Um, then we're going to talk about, okay, so now that I understand NTOP and I know where and when I might use it and I know how it compares to NTOP NG, how do I actually get started? Um, how do I go about that initial setup? Uh, what, what are the things I need to know about NTOP's configuration file, which is called ntop.conf? And then we'll take a look at the user interface uh, and see kind of how we uh, get around that and what are the most common screens we use uh, in the user interface. So what is NTOP? Well, NTOP uh, captures packets. Uh, it, it sits on the network and it listens to all the network traffic that it can see or that it is exposed to. And it tabulates all that traffic and put, tries to put it in some kind of meaningful form. Um, so rather than just being a line-by-line -line list of every frame that went across the wire, which to the administrator might be difficult to interpret, it might be difficult to glean any meaning from. Uh, NTOP does that processing for the administrator and tabulates the traffic and presents it in a read readable form through its web interface. So on this slide there's a, um, a sort of a, a partial screenshot of what I might be typically looking at when I use NTOP. So uh, in this display and we'll see a, a regular live one in a few minutes, you know, NTOP is telling me that you know, I heard the following hosts, 
and they had these at IP addresses, and I've tabulated that this is how much bandwidth they're using, and that can be displayed as a as a bar, or it can be displayed in, in absolute numbers as well. Uh, NTOP gives us a lot of different information about those hosts. I've just clipped a few of the columns that that are in the uh, web uh, NTOP user interface. Uh, so the number of hops to that host, the number of contacts that host has had, and uh, the the amount of uh, act, age and inactivity, so the amount of time that the that host has, has spent transmitting on the network. So of particular use to a network administrator just in this display is who, the who being the host uh, IP addresses. That tells me who is doing stuff on the network. Um, it might tell me uh, that one particular host is occupying the vast majority of the bandwidth. And so way back when in 2001, 2002, when I started using NTOP, that was one of my primary concerns. Um, who was uh, hogging the bandwidth, possibly causing the network to be slow, and uh, being able to identify that host. And sometimes it was intentional and sometimes it was unintentional. Um, you know, even to this day, people download uh, executable programs onto their systems and they're not even aware that they uh, are causing so much network activity. So this, you know, NTOP's a great tool for identifying that. And um, as I said before, later in later years, you know, NTOP was also a great way to discover uh, malware. It was also a, a great tool to use to find hosts on the network that were engaged in peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So like in this display we have in front of us here, if one particular host had a thousand times as many host contacts as everyone else on the network, that's an indication that there's some unusual activity um, going on on that particular host, and we'd want to track that down and, and remedy that. If we see, for example, that host contacts for one particular user are you know, in the tens of thousands, whereas most other users only have 50 to 100, uh, either that particular host that has all those host contacts is a proxy server, or more likely they are uh, engaged in some kind of network activity that we want to address. So in previous uh, summer ser webinar series uh, sessions, we have talked about Wireshark. And you may have uh, heard about Wireshark. Wireshark's uh, another great tool that I think every network administrator has to have. And so the first thing, one of the first things I get asked about NTOP is, well, it sounds like what NTOP does is just the same thing as Wireshark. And that is partially true. They both uh, perform the same exercise of capturing packets on the network. The difference is what they do with those packets once they've accumulated them. So I, I've made an analogy here, and maybe this works, maybe it doesn't, but it's kind of like walking into a restaurant. If I walk into a restaurant and I sit down, they typically hand me a menu. I could, I could study what the restaurant offers uh, in terms of entrees in one of two ways. You could uh, tell me all the ingredients that go into making something, or you could just tell me what the end result is, and I can choose from it. So NTOP is kind of like a restaurant menu. It tells you that the menu, that the restaurant offers pizza. It tells you that you can get a cheese pizza, a veggie pizza, or a sausage pizza. But Wireshark wouldn't tell you that. Wireshark would tell you that something along the lines of, well, we, we use yeast, and we use water, and we use flour, and then we take tomatoes and we dice them, and then we spread them across the, you know, and so you could, you could study those steps and try to guess that, well, all those particular ingredients must amount to a pizza when they're done, but I'm not really sure. Or you could simply look at the menu, and the menu says, yes, we offer pizza, and these are the different forms we offer it in. So that, to me, is a good analogy of 
well, I think it's a good analogy, of how NTOP differs from Wireshark. Wireshark tells you every ingredient, every packet that it saw on the network, and it lists them in a chronological format. However, it does little, I'm not going to say nothing, but it does little to assist the administrator in analyzing what those packets amount to. NTOP gathers those same packets and says, well, you know, I can see that this particular host is engaged in a file share because I've accumulated all these different lines of ingredients and I can tell that in the end they, they amount to a file share. So both are capturing the same data, but what they're doing with that data is fundamentally different. So if I were to get started on NTOP, um, I would need an NTOP server, and here are some system requirements that, uh, really the minimum requirements I would want that server to have. The more processing power, the more memory, the better. Um, NTOP is, uh, is a processor intensive application, so we want to have as strong a hardware as we possibly can. We also want to have, if at all possible, it's highly preferable to have two network interface cards. So that kind of eliminates uh, using NTOP on laptops. Laptops typically only have one hardwired uh, interface card, but it doesn't completely eliminate the ability to use laptops, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But we do strongly prefer to have two network interface cards on our NTOP server. So what it looks like is uh, depicted in this diagram. Those two network interface cards, one is going to be plugged into the network into a regular access port. Uh, that is the interface that we're going to use as administrators to interact with NTOP so that what World Wide Web interface we mentioned a few minutes ago. That's how we're going to uh, view that and manipulate that and gather information from that in a human readable form. The second interface card is going into uh, promiscuous mode so that uh, being in promiscuous mode, it allows that network interface card to see all the traffic that passes across the wire that it has access to. Uh, and not simply have access to packets that were intended for the host that's running NTOP. That's a very important point that everyone has to keep in mind because it's, it's very often the first obstacle that new NTOP users run into. Um, if you look at your NTOP user interface and you only see the NTOP server itself, and maybe one, other two, one or two other hosts, in almost every case, it is because that second interface card, the one that you have designated to capture traffic on, has not been put into promiscuous mode and is, does not have access to all of the traffic on the network, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. So then we have this server, where do we put it? Well, this diagram shows where we most commonly install the NTOP server. So for an LEA, um, uh, we typically are putting the NTOP server in the central office or wherever the network core is located. And we're very often plugging it into the, the core switch and we are capturing the traffic of either the internet uh, uplink or we are capturing that traffic uh, from the Metro E aggregate. And so what we call, we call those, and different vendors who, who manufacture switches call these things, uh, they use some slightly different terminology, but typically that means we have a mirror source, which is the interface on the switch we want to read. And then we have a mirror destination, which is where that second interface from our NTOP server is plugged in. So in every case that we're using NTOP, uh, where we want to have live and real-world results, we are going to have a mirror source and a mirror destination. 
And the question is just, and this depends on how our network is laid out and how much power we have on that NTOP server, the question then just becomes what ports will be that mirror source and that mirror destination. In some cases, we don't have enough power to measure all of the uh, traffic on that Metro E aggregate. So for example, and I'm just going to make this uh, graphic pop out a little bit so I can do some sketching. So in this graphic, uh, if that Metro E aggregate were simply too large and we could not um, capture and analyze all of the traffic available on it, um, we would have a problem because what NTOP would end up doing is actually dropping packets. So right here we have the Metro E aggregate coming into our central office core switch. This is very often, the reason I point this out is this is very often the source of what we want to analyze with NTOP. However, this NTOP server probably has an interface card on it that we're using to, to uh, capture the packets, and it probably has a maximum of one gig. If our Metro E aggregate is two gig, we are not going to be able to capture and process all of the traffic that's coming into the core switch. Um, and what NTOP will end up doing is dropping packets. And if NTOP drops some packets, a very small percentage, like 1 or 2%, it's still usable data. We can still um, make an assessment of what kind of issues, what kind of patterns are, are on that network. But if this Metro E aggregate is 2 gig or, or greater, um, then this is not a good location for the NTOP server. We cannot process uh, that many packets coming in. And that's where the NTOP NG we mentioned, um, I think, on slide number two. Um, but the NTOP next generation is better suited for this kind of scenario. Because with NTOP NG, uh, we are not processing every packet that comes from the mirror source. We, we are going to tell the switch, using, when we're using NTOP NG, to send only a sample to the destination. And there's different sampling techniques that it uses, but it's essentially a net flow sample. Um, so that rather than NTOP having to process every packet that's coming in on this um, rather large pipe, two gig or more, it only has to process a, a percentage of those. Um, surprisingly, when NTOP NG processes a small percentage of the traffic rather than all the packets that are on the wire, it still presents the data very accurately, just as though it had captured every packet. So that was the most common scenario. And of course, if that Metro E aggregate is less than a gig, this scenario still works very well. Um, if, it's, if it's a small school system or a charter school, this is still the preferred setup because we have NTOP uh, installed at the core. Uh, it's capable of capturing every packet. Uh, we can run the NTOP process whenever, whenever we want, and we get, a, we get a full and very accurate depiction of what is taking place on the network. But what about those large Metro E aggregate circuits where our NTOP server simply cannot process all the data that's coming across that wire, and it's going to drop too many packets if we force it to? Well, in that case, we, we can... We can have multiple NTOP servers, or we can choose a different installation point for the NTOP server. So in this scenario, if I knew, uh, if I had a, a star network, such as what's being uh, depicted in this diagram, and I knew, or I got frequent reports that the uh, internet is slow from the high school, 
Uh, but I didn't get similar complaints from the elementary schools, nor did I get similar complaints from the middle schools. It, I have some indication that the problem uh, that the high school is experiencing stems from the network activity at the high school itself. And if that were the case, and, and most of my support calls for slow internet come from that location, I might very well just install the NTOP server at that location. And this has the benefit of the fact that this link uh, that connects the high school back to the central office is probably a gig or less. And so my NTOP server is probably capable of processing all that data. And so that makes it a perfect match. Um, so I can have more than one NTOP server. Um, and again, we have a, remember, we have a, a web interface to the NTOP server. So it's okay if we're at the central office, but the server is located at a remote location. We're still going to be able to access it. We're still going to be able to look at the data that it presents. But in, in some cases, I may simply want the NTOP server to be at an alternate location to avoid having to try and process that large Metro E aggregate uh, circuit. NTOP can also go on laptops, but uh, there's, some, there's some caveats with that. Just uh, be careful when setting up NTOP on a laptop. Remember we said a laptop typically only has one wired network interface card. So in cases where uh, and school districts really wanted to have a portable laptop, we have uh, set it up in a couple of ways. Uh, one way is to use the wireless as the administrator's connection. So that first interface where we talked about uh, NTOP presents its data in a, in a World Wide Web format, we use the wireless interface on the network card for that. Uh, in other cases, we add a second interface card uh, to the laptops. And the, and the client network engineering team at, at MCNC does this quite regularly. We use uh, NTOP on laptops and we use PCMCIA cards or uh, EC Express cards uh, as that second interface. Just be careful that before you put in a purchase order to go get that USB PCMCIA or EC card that it does have a Linux driver, that it is compatible with Linux um, because in most cases you're going to be running NTOP on Linux. You don't want to purchase a card only to realize that it's not going to work because there's no driver available for it. That problem is more prevalent, and there's other problems that are prevalent with this as well, when you're using a USB Ethernet card. Um, laptops are portable, you know, but, so we can uh, move them quickly to a location that's, that's uh, saying they have a problem. If we only have one network interface card, and I've run into this in many cases, where we just simply don't have a secondary interface available, we go ahead and use the uh, hardwired network interface card on the laptop, and then we use the laptop itself as the administrative interface. Um, so that's one way to get around that problem uh, of having only one network interface card. So I mentioned a couple times NTOP, and I've also mentioned NTOP NG. And uh, NTOP NG is the future, and NTOP uh, development work on NTOP itself has, has largely slowed down or halted. And it's clear that NTOP is, is the, the future direction that, that this project is going. It's actually forked off into a new product entirely. So NTOP NG is different. Um, it looks different to the administrator. It requires a slightly different setup. Um, and it is not something that we in the CNE group are, are deploying a lot right now because of the requirements to get NTOP NG uh, up and running. In particular, um, the flow protocols are going to be an issue whereby you have to configure your local switches to present that sampling data to NTOP NG. And that processing, um, that presentation of those samples that NTOP NG uses um, and sending them to your NTOP NG server uh, requires that your switch uh, occupy a lot of its time, a lot of its CPU time doing that. Um, so for now, we continue to use NTOP. Um, NTOP, you know, as we described, has that uh, 
limitation of capturing traffic only at the wire speed that's available to it. Um, it does not use those sampling techniques. So in the NTOP world, you need more CPU power on your server. But in the NTOP NG world, you need more CPU power from your network switch. So how do I get NTOP if, uh, if I decide to use it? Well, the easiest way to, to get NTOP and to have a lot of these issues um, worked out for you is to just ask for a CNE probe. If you've asked for a CNE probe and you've sent the hardware uh, to MCNC to have the probe uh, image put on it, um, if you sent hardware that had two NIC cards, you're ready to go. So NTOP is on that system, and it's a similar version, a similar operating system, as well as a similar version of NTOP as the ones that the CNE group uses here at MCNC. Uh, you can, if you have an existing um, server, uh, you can download binaries, which are available not just for Linux. There are limited versions that are available for uh, Windows 32-bit, 64-bit, as well as Mac OS, um, but don't expect all the features um, that NTOP has available on uh, Unix-based operating systems to be available on those other operating systems. Uh, and if all else fails, you've got um, a Linux host and you want, but it, there are no binaries available for it, but you really want to have NTOP running on it, you can download the source code and compile it. The source code comes with instructions for compiling it. Just make sure that your operating system has packages uh, installed on it that make compiling code possible. In particular, on a Linux system, you would need kernel headers and you would need the GCC compiler. So what about those uh, mirror ports we talked about um, in our NTOP location diagrams. Well, remember, NTOP has to have a mirror port available or a span port available to it in order to see all the traffic on the network. If we don't set this up, we are going to run into the very common problem that, that I hear many times that, hey, I've got NTOP running, but when I look at the logs, when I look at the user interface, I only see a couple of hosts in the data. I'm not seeing everybody else that I know is on the network. In almost every case, that's because the monitor port was not set up. And NTOP can only see the unicast packets that are sent to the server itself, as well as any broadcast and possibly multicast packets um, that the, uh, the NTOP server was allowed to, or permitted to see. If we, But that's not why we're using NTOP. We're using NTOP to see all the network traffic. And in order to do that, we need to have some kind of monitor port. And here's a couple uh, configuration examples, Cisco and Procurve, of how that's set up. So NTOP's uh, configuration is entirely derived from, well, really two sources. One, when you run NTOP on your server, you can add command line switches to it. But in most cases, what we're doing is we're using what's called an NTOP configuration file or NTOP conf. This is where uh, we pass all the parameters we want to the NTOP process um, to make the collected data more usable, more useful to us as administrators. So this slide just shows kind of what um, an NTOP configuration file looks like. Uh, I'm going to bring up another window that shows what it's like to actually edit that file. So on my screen now is the uh, bash uh, uh, shell of an NTOP server. And in order to configure NTOP, I'm going to edit that NTOP comp file. That's where all the work gets done. So I'm going to start my editor. And now I'm in uh, the VI editor, which you can think of that as sort of like Notepad. And in this configuration file, 
I'm, I can find all of the parameters that NTOP has been set up uh, to use. So one, the, the import, I'm just going to point out some of the important ones. Uh, and um, you know, if you have questions, you can email CNE or myself if you have questions about any of these other parameters. But the really important ones are the interface parameter. Uh, you have to tell NTOP which interface it's going to listen for traffic on. Uh, you also want to tell NTOP which networks on your, which subnets on your network are local. So very typically that's 10.0 slash 8. It's usually safe to put that in there. 172.16 and 192.168. These are, uh, in my NTOP configuration files, these are in here permanently. because These are always private local addresses, and I want that data, again, to be more useful, to be more understandable to me as the administrator, and so I want NTOP to make the distinction between hosts that are on my network and hosts that are out there on the Internet somewhere. So I've got a slide that shows uh, a couple couple other important um, NTOP configuration uh, parameters. So this will be uh, a good slide to have in the recording of this session it, because some of these will not make any sense now, but you'll want to go back and review these when you're setting up your NTOP server. Um, so I'm just going to run through them real quickly. Uh, no Mac. No max is a very important uh, parameter for the NTOP configuration file. It tells NTOP, don't rely on MAC addresses when you're presenting who's who in that readout. Um, MAC addresses are sometimes, well, we, we know that the, the source MAC address of traffic changes when that traffic passes through a router. So NTOP will get confused by that, and very often uh, you will see a, a remote school's router address as being a user on the network. And of course, we know it's not, so we want to disable that feature. Um, we don't want NTOP to collect data on both interfaces, ETH0 and ETH1, so we say no interface merge. Again, we indicate what the local subnets are, 10.0, 192, 168. Um, we don't bother collecting IPv6 data unless we're actually using that, but in most cases we're not, so we indicate use IPv4 only. And NTOP does a thing called host tracking, where it actually um, keeps track of, of every session, every TCP session uh, between hosts. And when it does that, it takes up a lot of CPU. And so we, I very often will tell NTOP, don't do that. Just do that for local hosts. I only don't bother tracking um, all the session data of hosts that are not even on my network because even if I found a problem there, I don't have access, I don't have permission to correct it. So, and I'm really only interested in hosts on my own network. So track local hosts is another important switch. What happens if something goes wrong? NTOP will tell you in almost every instance why it's not running or why it's not working. It logs events to its host syslog. So in the Linux world, um, particularly uh, in previous versions of Linux that don't use the journal logging, uh, you simply have to say tail var log messages, which shows you the last few lines of the syslog. And in almost every case, when something went wrong with NTOP, it will tell you in those lines, uh, especially if you do it in, in a timely manner. So you're, you're checking the uh, messages syslog fairly soon or recent after there's been an NTOP problem, it's going to tell you in those last few lines what that problem was. So how do you, uh, using uh, NTOP, as we'll see in a minute, it has a web interface. Uh, that web interface always uses port 3000. Um, using the bash command line like we did a minute ago, we can also verify that NTOP is actually running or if it crashed for some reason. Uh, again, the troubleshooting in the syslogs is done on, on most systems in var log messages. Um, so looking at that file uh, is very helpful. 
uh, to, to diagnose problems that you've had with NTOP. Um, we're also going to look in a few minutes at how we can take some of that Wireshark data and have NTOP present it to us. So that remember we said remember we said that Wireshark uh, captures really the same information. Uh, it's just what it does with that information that is fundamentally different from NTOP. Well, what if we had a bunch of captures um, that we've done on our network, which is very likely because Wireshark can run on any laptop, and maybe we've gone around the school system's network and, and captured um, or created packet captures on each local network. We can import those into NTOP and have NTOP present the data to us. So we've got the benefit of all that detailed information that Wireshark gathers, but rather than trying to analyze it and make sense of it ourselves, we just tell, uh, tell NTOP to do that. And so we get nice graphs and tables and things like that rather than just packet data. So I'm going to go to that uh, interface and I'm going to, um, again, look at the uh, NTOP config file. I'm going to look at the syslog file to, and, and we're going to start up NTOP and look at the data we get. Now, before I do that, I'm going to go back to, and I just want to check my chat window to see if, um, okay, just want to check and make sure there weren't any questions lingering out there before we got started. So let's take a look at the, uh, before we get into starting NTOP, I just want to take another look at the NTOP config file. Um, Typically, uh, unless your NTOP server is portable, you're not going to be changing this very often. Uh, and I say I bring up the portable scenario because sometimes um, when you uh, are capturing uh, NTOP traffic uh, and using it at a remote site like one of your schools, you may want to change that local subnets option. So so that you get a better understanding of how the hosts at that school are interacting perhaps with servers at your central office or perhaps with hosts at another location, you may want to tweak this parameter and limit the local host uh, variable to just the network for the school that you are currently at. So this is something you might tweak if you move your NTOP server around the system and are capturing the traffic at different locations. Uh, another, uh, another important parameter you may want to consider in, in the NTOP configuration file is numeric IP addresses. NTOP is very user-friendly. It tries to be very user-friendly. When it presents its data and it is tracking uh, network traffic from a particular host, it will automatically try to resolve that IP address into a host name so that when you are looking at uh, NTOP data, when you're looking at the results, uh, it will present to you a human readable host name if it can so that the interpretation of those results are easier for you to understand. Well, in order to do that, NTOP is going to do a lot of DNS lookups. It's go and they're all going to be reverse lookups, right? Because NTOP has the IP address and wants to know if the DNS server that you have designated for the, the NTOP server can resolve those to a logical name. Well, that can, that can take time. And uh, if, I'm not, if I don't really need to know those host names, um, I use this parameter that we see in front of us just to have the numeric IP addresses show up uh, in the NTOP results. So those are a couple other common uh, NTOP.comp um, uh, parameters that I always have turned on. So starting NTOP is fairly easy. Um, it's going to be in the path of, of, of your bash profile in all likelihood. And uh, just to be safe, before I just simply type NTOP, I specify that I want it to use that config file we were just using, uh, just looking at. Um, 
This allows me, by the way, to have multiple config files, so I could have one for each school that I'm using this NTOP server at. Again, if the NTOP server is mobile, I'm moving it around. I could have multiple config files, so I don't have to, or my designee does not have to get into editing the NTOP comp file if they don't want to. Um, we can simply point NTOP to different configuration files, but in this case, we're using the default. The default file, um, the default configuration path for NTOP is etc ntop.com. And so NTOP's going to start running. And uh, it, at one time, um, the NTOP developers tried to merge um, geospatial data with um, the IP data that it was gathering. So NTOP has, will throw these error messages that are not, that have no consequence, but it throws these error messages saying it cannot find the, the geography data. But that's fine. We know NTOP is running. So that means I can go to a web browser. And I can type in the IP address of that host. And you may have noticed in the config file that NTOP always runs on port 3000. So after um, I visit that website, um, I should see a display like this. And I, the first thing I always want to do is make sure that my monitor port is working. So I want to make sure NTOP is actually seeing data for the whole network, not just for packets that were sent to or from the NTOP server. And so I can really choose any of these options in order to do that. But when I pull up one of NTOP's tables, over on the left here, I want to see more than one or two IP addresses. If I see 10, 12, or in, in the case of a large school district, I'll see hundreds of lines because that, and that tells me I have my monitor port set up correctly and NTOP can see all the traffic on the network. Pretty much everything in the NTOP user interface is clickable. So uh, I can see that my uh, most active host is 10105225 because I'm sorting by the data column, I can see that it has over half the network traffic on this particular subnet. But as I said, everything is clickable. So if I want to know more about this host, I can just click on it. And NTOP gives me a lot of information about what time of day this, tra this host sent uh, its traffic. It also tells me what kind of traffic. So uh, it'll tell me what percentage is broadcast, what percentage is unicast, what percentage is TCP versus what is UDP. It also tells me whom it's talking with. And this, this section down here is one of the most useful uh, pieces of information that come from NTOP. It not only tells me who the busiest host on the network is, but it tells me what they're doing who they're talking to, and that's this list right here, last contacted peers, and also how are they how are they talking with them? Now if it's just HTTP and HTTPS, that may not be a cause for concern, that just may simply be a busy user on the network, but traffic on other ports and traffic on uh, TCP recently used ports are a great way to find malware infected hosts. So for example, I, I use NCREN for my internet connection and I get one of those network abuse notifications. And it says Sony Pictures, or whoever, has d determined that a host from your IP address has been downloading uh, the latest film to come out on DVD. Pick one. And of course you look at that and you, you realize well I can't really tell who that was because the only thing that's listed in this notification is an IP address which is most likely the IP address of my firewall so that's not helpful. And it maybe tells me a port number. Well all of a sudden because of NTOP that port number in that network abuse notification 
becomes helpful. You can find the hosts on your network that are communicating on that particular uh, port. And there, in many instances, uh, NTOP has pointed the way to who on a network, for me personally, who on the network is using peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, applications. So back on my command line, um, I've lost control of my prompt because I'm running NTOP, and so long as NTOP is running, I don't have the ability to do anything else on this server. Uh, and so that makes uh, that makes the uh, shell unavailable. Now I can open a second shell. Um, however, running NTOP in this particular way uh, presents a problem. Because if I exit this shell, if I disconnect from the server, and again, this server might be at the high school and I'm at the central office, and my machine does a Windows update during the night, that means that machine's going to reboot, it's going to close this connection, I'm going to lose this shell, and it's also going to kill the NTOP process. So NTOP has a way of working around that. I'm going to control C to break out of this, and I'm going to go back to that config file. Down at the bottom, NTOP says it can be run as a daemon. Daemon is a, is a Unix word that when translated just means uh, like Windows service. In other words, it's going to run in the background. So I, I've enabled that option to run in the background. And when I run NTOP now, it starts running, but I get my prompt back. And because it's running in the background, or it's running as a service, I can actually exit out of this shell, um, and NTOP continues to run. So um, there's various ways to do that. Run it as a daemon, run it as a startup service on the Linux system. But that's a very important point to understand. There's um, two very different ways of running NTOP. One is in the foreground, and one is in the background. And on a portable or a laptop server that's running NTOP, running it in the foreground is probably just fine. But on a server that I have installed on my network core that I'm going to have run NTOP every morning for one hour to see what users are doing, I probably want it to run as a service so I don't have to stay connected to that uh, remote shell 100% of the time. How do I check to see if NTOP's actually running? This is a very important, very helpful command uh, to remember. You do a process search. And you filter using grep, you filter on the word NTOP. And you should see a line that says a user named NTOP has this process identifier running this command. And if NTOP ever crashes, you won't see that line, and, and you'll know you have to start it over again. You'll, the other way you'll know NTOP has crashed is if the user interface, the web interface, stops responding. So process search um, and filtering on, gre on uh, grepping NTOP tells me, and you can use that for any process on a Unix-based system, but that tells me that NTOP is still running. If that line is not there, NTOP has crashed for some reason. And remember we said when we're troubleshooting NTOP, we're going to look at the syslog. And the tail command just shows us the last few lines of the syslog. I don't actually have a problem here, but if I did, it would tell me why uh, NTOP has crashed. Let's take a look at that syslog message, because as I was getting ready for this session, I did have a problem with getting NTOP to start. And if I can find where that particular section of NTOP was running, I see commands like network is unreachable. Um, when, you, when NTOP says that, it typically cannot use the interface and it has crashed as a result. It typically cannot use the interface that you specified for the sniffing. Remember, we said the sniffing was going to take place on ETH1. 
NTOP has to have an ETH1 available. If it's a, a USB card or a PC card or it's a, an onboard interface that's been disabled, if NTOP cannot bring that device up, it will crash. And so you very often have to uh, make sure that that interface, actually make sure both interfaces are running, and you can do that with the IF config command. Um, last thing before we go, uh, we said we were going to use NTOP to read Wireshark data. That's actually very simple. Now, right now, I, I don't want to engage in that because I already have NTOP running. So I'm going to kill NTOP. And now I don't see that line that says NTOP is running. So I've plugged in a, uh, I've captured some packets using Wireshark and I've got them on a USB device or I've used FTP to copy them onto my NTOP server. But by whatever method, I have my PCAP file available on the NTOP server. Um, so in my case, I, as I said, I, I copied it to a USB drive. I plugged in the USB drive. USB is always a little tricky with Linux. But the D message command will tell me that when I plugged in a USB drive, the system found it and called it SDB. So I'm just going to, um, and if you, ha if you have the GUI for Linux available on your system, you won't have to do all this, but I'm just going to um, mount the first partition on that USB drive onto a mount point that I called USB. And on that USB uh, drive, I've got a file, a Wireshark file called test PCAP. So I'm going to copy that over here. And I'm going to double check, make sure I didn't leave NTOP running because I don't want to run it twice. No, NTOP's not running. So now I'm going to tell NTOP, don't run based on that config file, etc ntop.com. Don't do that. Um, although some of the parameters in there NTOP will still use even in this process. I'm not going to point NTOP to that config file because it's in the default path. I'm just going to tell it to open a file called test PCAP. And it does that in the foreground, so I've lost my prompt, but that's okay. So now when I go to the user interface of NTOP, it's not showing me information about my local network. It's showing me information about that Wireshark packet capture I did. And so in a very real scenario, and we do this all the time, we, we go to a high school, we go to a middle school, we plug into the local switch with our laptop, and we do a Wireshark capture. We capture all kinds of data on the, let's say, Metro E uplink port. And when we have all that data, and we save them all to, U, to a USB drive, we can come back to our NTOP host, and plug those in and, and we can look with great detail on what was going on on the network at that school. And so that is how you read Wireshark data. Very simple, but how you read Wireshark and the data using NTOP. And another great thing about this is you, you have captured that data and you can, I guess, own it permanently. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, NTOP, when it is sniffing packets on the network, as we've been doing in the previous examples, when you kill NTOP or you stop it, it purges all its data. So NTOP continues to accumulate data up until the point that, that the process dies or the process has been terminated by the administrator. When you use Wireshark to capture the data, you have a permanent record. Um, you can you can have a, a server, and, and of course Wireshark can run from the command line, it can run in Windows, it can run in Linux, it can run on Mac OS, and you can be capturing data all the time, and you have a permanent record of that data. Sniffing traffic on the network is not something that I personally do all the time. 
because it's a process, it's processor intensive. The values, the amount of traffic each host has generated, they all become very large values. And so if I have a particular problem on this particular day, what and I'm running NTOP 24 7, 52 weeks out of the year. When I log into NTOP, it's hard for me to tell who's causing the problem right now. So I use NTOP in the sniffing mode for short periods of time when I have a particular problem. Typically, my NTOP server, the, and, which is a server that does other things as well, but typically it's not running NTOP all the time because the more data NTOP gathers, the less easy it is for me as an administrator to decipher what is causing a problem at this particular moment. So run your NTOP servers when you see problems because the purpose of NTOP is to help you find those problems. Okay, I am going to go back to my chat window and see if I have any questions. It doesn't look like I have any questions. See someone typing, so I'm just going to wait till the typing gets done. But I'm going to stop the screen share so I can go back to my regular interface. So we'll get to that question in a minute um, if it is such. Okay, so the question, I think everybody watching the video or who's going to be watching the video in the future, I think they can see the question, but I'll read it out anyway. It says, when you're using Zscaler, will NTOP pick up ports being used with BitTorrent? Um, yes, but Zscaler is going to have little to nothing to do with BitTorrent. Remember, when you have Zscaler configured at your district, only HTTP and HTTPS are being forwarded to Zscaler. Um, since NTOP is installed most commonly at your network core, or maybe it's installed at a particular school, it's inside your firewall. So the answer is yes. Yeah, NTOP will see anything that goes across the wire and is visible from that mirror port. Yes, it's picking up data before, uh, since it's inside your firewall, it's not only picking up data before it goes out onto the internet, NTOP is actually picking up uh, traffic that wasn't going to the internet at all. Remember, a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic on your network might be uh, simply between a, a client machines and servers that are back at your central office. Well, if you're using your firewall as your as, as your aggregate as your as your data collection point, you're using that to uh, analyze um, the, your your network traffic. You're not going to see that that traffic between a client and a local server. But on a span port, if, assuming that NTOP's in the correct location and that span the monitor port is set up correctly, uh, NTOP will see that data when your firewall and or Zscaler wouldn't see it at all. All right, thanks very much. Going to stop the recording, and I hope this is useful to people um, in the archive. Thank you.